before we get into some fishy business, let's get some reaction from everyone in the audience. So can I see a show of hands of everyone who has self-proclaimed yourself as a seafood lover? Please put up your hands. All right, nice. Okay, please keep the hands up there, please. Yes, thank you. And now, tell me, if, please raise your hands, if you have had seafood twice or more in the last 24 hours. Please put up your other hand. So I want to see the one hand there and two hands. So how many of us have got two hands up there? All right, yes. If you look around, if you look around the audience, you'll actually see that we had many, many hands up in the air. Yes, please, can we please bring your hands down, huh? Thank you for participating. And that was just to give you a quick snapshot of how much Malaysians love our seafood. All right. We are the fifth largest seafood consumer in the world. We've talked Japan. Yes, all right. We consume 57 kilograms of seafood per person per year. All right, that's heavier than me. All right, so that is essentially translates to eating, eating seafood at least once or twice every day. And if you think about it, it's quite true, right? Your ikamales in your nasi lama, your fish paste in your yong tau fu, your, you know, your cockles or your udang in your mi goreng. So there's a lot of seafood, you know, saturated amongst our diet. And what's important is that seafood actually provides one third of our animal protein. So seafood is not just food, it is also food security for Malaysians. Now, how would you feel if I were to tell you that every single one of you in this room, everyone out on the street, our family members, our colleagues, every single Malaysian have contributed <coughs> to overfishing of not just in our waters, but also in neighboring waters. How? by over-consuming seafood. We've eaten so much seafood that over the years, the trends of seafood consumption has increased 140%, 170% of what we used to eat, right? But at the same time, we see a comparable decline of our fish stocks, the amount of fish we have in our oceans. So the conclusion, we're all, all eating our fish. fish. Right now, our current productions are no longer able to sustain our demand. So we've started importing from neighboring countries like Thailand and Indonesia, you know, to save our local demand, expanding the crisis of overfishing into neighboring waters. So let me share a story about how this reality made itself known in my life. My love affair with seafood started when I was five, the day my grandma introduced me to shark puto. Shark puto was this amazing dish made of shredded shark meat with all the Indian spices, it was bursting in flavors, it's very popular in South India. It was love at first sight for me. And I used to be a scrawny kid who hated food. Horror stories of trying to keep me fat about. My mom used to flip my cheek, and when I would open my mouth to scream, she would stuff food in. <laughs> and I'm sure right, right now, today, that's probably you know, enough sufficient pause to call up the hotline, but in the 70s, that was good parenting. <laughs> so, falling in love with food was a big deal for someone like me. So, grandma used to make this twice a day, and sorry, twice a month, and, and that became my reward system to make sure I eat all my other meals. And when grandma passed on, we continued the tradition. We, and we would reminisce, we used that opportunity to reminisce about our time with, her, with grandma. Um, you know, so the family essentially bonded over shark puto. That's how I grew up. 20 years later, I'm with WWF Malaysia. I'm running a sustainable seafood campaign. And I'm developing a seafood guide to help Malaysians choose how to eat sustainably. And in the course of my research, I found out that sharks were all listed under the red list, which is basically the avoid list, because we have been overfished. There's very little sharks left in the world oceans, and we're still catching them. I was heartbroken. My love affair was over. 
I went back home and told my parents. There was absolute silence on the dining table. My mom looked mutinous, as moms do. My sisters were shattered. My dad was the only one who was calm because he had just turned vegetarian. <laughs> as you think about this, right, and as you listen to the story, I am sure you would also recall some of those missing seafood from your own family menus. You know, things that you would have had previously with your grandparents that you no longer have because maybe it's not available. For example, the dish of sago, which is a very special dish served by the Sabahans during their um, weddings. Or even, you know, you know more, more commonly, the silver pomfret that used to be a main feature in Chinese New celebrations and family reunions. You know, they are no longer there. Have you wondered why? So in what? Sorry? <laughs> and the reason why it's expensive, right? So let's think about that. On the other hand, so in one hand, we're talking about missing seafood from our diets. On the other hand, let's talk about inclusion of plastics in our diet. And I'm talking about microplastics. All right? A recent study shows that 77% of the people sampled had microplastics in their blood. And concurrent studies of you know, fishes show that anything between 25% to 49% of the fishes sampled contain microplastics. So if you think about over-consuming seafood, it's not just unsustainable for the planet and the oceans, it may be not health, very healthy for us as well, because it would seem that we are accumulating plastic for seafood. So, what happens now? Another area to talk about when you think about overfishing is overcapacity. Overcapacity is essentially the, an open war declaration of the fishing vessels against the fishes. It's an incident of too many boats catching too few fishes. And this march against the fishes are led by the commercial fisheries or the industrial fishing. So imagine this big troll boats that you know, literally sweeps everything in the ocean floor, or this huge fur seines with those really large mouths that could you know, scoop all the fishes in the, in the water bodies as well. And this expansion of fisheries was introduced in Malaysia in the 60s. And you can see that right after that, within 10 years, there are already some of those areas that are already showing signs of being all fished because of this expansion in the 70s. But what's worse is what's happening in the 2010. Right? It's a lot worse. We've lost anything between 80% to 90% of what we used to have in our waters. And we're losing more every single day. Is this only in Malaysia? No. This is a global <coughs> crisis. Everywhere around the world, we are seeing fisheries collapsing or categorized as being overexploited. And what's driving this is, again, overexpansion of commercial fleets. And these commercial fleets are supported by obscene subsidies to the value of 35.4 billion US dollars. And 80% of that subsidy is going towards commercial fishing. So, fisheries is in hot soup. So you might be saying, hey, hang on. Aquaculture. Let's talk aquaculture. Right. Aquaculture has been very much wanted as the solution to the ocean processing crisis. You know, because it would actually help consumers to reduce fishing pressure by opting for farm seafood. That would be amazing if we are indeed farming seafood. But we are not. We are merely transferring seafood. In aquaculture, most farm seafood requires feed input. And since most of the species are actually coming from the wild, from the marine environment, do you want to guess where the feed is coming from? Absolutely right. We are taking wild fish and feeding it to farm fish so that we can have farm seafood. How sustainable is that? The feed conversion ratio in aquaculture is terrible. So wild fish is either used as it is, fresh and chopped, and we call that trash fish, or they process into 
fish meal powder or fish oil. In a common anthropology setting where, it's, where we're using trash fish, it requires anything between four kilograms to eight kilograms of trash fish to produce one kilogram of farm sea bass or snapper or grouper. All right? And because in Malaysia, almost all of our agriculture industry is still very, very traditional, means they're still very small scale, the reliance on wild fisheries is high. And the challenge with small scale um, fish farmers is that they are very unreceptive to using alternative feed or even commercial feed because they perceive it as not giving it the fish is nice pink flush that will give them access to export markets like Hong Kong. So perception is also a challenge here on top of the actual process of farming. So if this is all happening, right, what is the state of our fisheries? When I started working in fisheries, one of the first things I did was a report called Fisheries and Poverty. I was trying to document the socioeconomic status of the fisheries industry. What I found out was that the fishing community were the poorest of the poor. The fisheries sector was at the bottom of the economic sector. So you had all kinds of sector and fisheries were at the no, bottom, bottom last of, of, that, of the list. And you know, fishers in Sabah and in Shunganu were the poorest in the country. You know, you know this list called the hardcore poor? They were in that category. And this, again, you know, is a challenge that we all need to think about very consciously. On why is this happening? Why are we not doing anything about this very group of people who are supporting us? So I met Pachin Ayan, who was a traditional fish farm, uh, fisher in Langkawi 16 years ago. He, was, he came from a family of fishermen, and he was very proud about his heritage. He was very, very industrious, so he would leave home at 5 o'clock in the morning, go out to the sea, set up his nets and traps, and then he had a small mussel farm, he would go and check on his farm, and then go back and collect his catch, and by 11, he would be back at the jetty to serve his catch. After that, he would go up to the hills, look at his fruit orchard and his papaya tree, and he would stay there until the evening and then he would come back home. And he used to tell me that he used to be a full-time fisher. He used to go out fishing twice a day, in the morning and the evening. And the ocean was so bountiful that there was enough for him and his family. You know, they, they were really happy. But now, he could barely make ends meet, which is why he had to diversify his income. So recently, just before the pandemic, I went back to Langkawi to meet Pachin Ayan. And I saw that his wooden boat was leaning against his porch in the house. That was, very, that was a very odd occurrence because you don't see boats up in porches, right? So I went up to him and said, what's, what's happening? Why is the boat here? And he said that the fishing was so bad and the resources has depleted so much that he could barely bring any catch at home. Most days, he came back empty. The nets were empty. And even when he caught anything, they were so small, the fishes were so small and sunk that they didn't have any commercial value. So he had decided to quit fishing and he's decided to go up to the hills to plant for a palm. That was a really sad day for small scale fishers. And so I, I, you know, I was confused. I said, you know, if you've decided to quit fishing, so why, is, well, why haven't you sold the boat? Because you can make some extra income from there. And he said, oh no, one day the fishes will come back and I will go out to fish, you know, because that's what, that's who I am. But I am 70 years old, and he's hopeful that the fishes will come back during his lifetime. He's still hopeful. And the COVID-19 has made the situation even worse. During the COVID-19, especially during the first MCO, because we didn't have proper plans in play, a lot of those local markets were all closed down. So I think uh, some of you would like, recall not having difficulty accessing fresh produce. So we had instances where fishers had seafood that did not have a market. They couldn't sell the products. 
You may have seen videos of seafood being dumped back into the ocean, and that was the reality. Fishermen had seafood that they couldn't sell. Right? And even the fish farmers, you know, because they had no market, because the export markets were all closed, the borders were closed, supply chain logistics were collapsed, had collapsed. So they just left the fish up in the farm. So they were basically, for that several months, they basically had no income. And when we came out of the MCL, because of, again, because of global supply chains, our wholesale prices no start for seafood. So they were still being paid pretense. In some, in some places, like in rural uh, villages in Sabah, we know that fishermen were being paid 30% less of what they used to get during this period because they had no access to other middlemen or even being able to go out to the town to sell the products. Right, so during this period, the incidences of poverty amongst this marginalized community increased a lot more. So, and you know, earlier we talked about, someone said about conspiracy, and you know, similarly there are many, many documentaries out there talking about how consumers need to stop eating seafood because it's not sustainable. But what we fail to comprehend is that the seafood industry supports 59 million fish farmers and fishermen as their livelihoods. And 80% of this group is actually traditional or small scale operators, which means Fishing and fish farming is the occupation of last resort. They do not have any other options. Right? These are the poorest, these are the most, hard, the most, the most marginalized, most hit by issues like climate change. So, what can we do as consumers? What we can do is we can actually not stop eating seafood because we do not want to hurt the small scale operators. But we can think about using a sustainable seafood guide to choose more sustainable seafood options, right? Or we can even think about consciously limiting the amount of seafood we consume. We can also start thinking about using more sustainable options for fish farming, such as insect meal. We do not want to use soy, maize, we don't want to use fish to farm seafood, but we can think about other options, and we need more people are going into such sustainability field. And lastly, we need to really think about reforming our small scale fisheries and fish farming so that you know people like Pachi Naya would have a livelihood. And also think about you know minimizing or even phasing out commercial fisheries in some space, some spaces in our oceans, so that we can sustain our natural environment. Let's build a sustainable and resilient fisheries industry by Malaysians for Malaysians. Thank you for listening.